This is chapter 22, The Wine Summit. The action takes place uh, over a decade ago, and I wrote this uh, over four years ago, uh, even though the book was just recently published. I think it still speaks very much to our times today, and this is why I've selected uh, this chapter to read for you today. So let's get started. <clears throat> In January, 2008, Paul and Bluey entered the cold garage with the gumption to be a winery to rack new wines. The process of siphoning clear wine at the top of the container from mucky mud leaves at the bottom. They had the classic hope of fools, thinking they could make great wine. It was the year of the audacity of hope. Luck loves fools and old men, and Paul was a fool to make wine, and his ignorance was bliss. He was fortunate, not worrying about what he didn't know, until he lost a batch. Professional winemakers and Carrie Ann cringed at his methods, but perhaps their judgment was too harsh, for Paul's simple methods recalled old days of winemaking in cultures where it was the responsibility of the household's head to make the family's wine. If an African-American could think of becoming president, why couldn't Sheila and Paul dream of making the best Tempranillo in California? They had advantages over larger commercial wineries. They could pick their grapes at perfect ripeness, sort each berry by hand, punch down by hand, press by hand, and manage everything closely, blend to perfection. They were a catamaran sailing smoothly on a lake. If they competed in the big red ocean, they'd need a large luxury liner or battleship to navigate rough seas. But in their little pond, with simple tools, they were well equipped for their task. To an outsider, the 32-gallon container in their garage was a trash can. Indeed, a black, heavy-duty plastic bag covered the top, a hood over the head of a suspect about to be waterboarded. The bag was sealed with duct tape wrapped around the container to keep out air. Paul peeled away the tape and pulled the bag over the can as if pulling a sweater over his head, careful not to let any yeast film floating on top sink, revealing a purple reflective pool. You could see anything looking into that violet mirror. Memories of a lover, the grapes from which the liquid was made, stomping those grapes with the muse. You could even see the future. He took his favorite winemaking tool. If a garage can dream of becoming a winery, can't a turkey baster dream of becoming a wine thief? Dipped it below the surface, sucked a sample into the column, and squeezed an ounce into a plastic cup. He kept glass out of the winery at all times, for if a glass were to break, Sheila, knowing shattered crystal flies to food in defiance of gravity, once threw out a buffet for 30 people when a guest dropped a glass in the kitchen. Paul banished all wine glasses from the winery lest Sheila threw out a barrel for fear of creating a deadly Chardonnay. Paul sipped, filling his mouth with currants and berries, one of the tasty, tastiest liquids he ever put on his tongue. But since he couldn't smell, put some of his fingers for Bluey, put some of put some on, on his fingers for Bluey, who gave it five licks. Paul knew it was good, a wine worthy of royalty. His intention was drawn to the radio, and he heard the presidential candidate speak. A voice stood out, a voice of reason, intelligence, honesty, hope. A shiver shook Paul's spine, not felt since he had been called to select San Diego's bishop, when his inner voice declared, This is the man. Nine months later, the election of America's first African-American president was a ray of light in the dark recession's tunnel and the beginning of the end of slavery's legacy. If Paul believed he could make great wine, if children believed in Santa Claus, their parents could believe in the grown-up version, President Barack Obama. The people, united, will never be defeated. Hope and change. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Keep hope alive. Alleluia. Predicted, prophesied, preordained in a garage. Seen in and reflected by an oracle of wine nine months earlier. This is the man for whom this wine is made. Joe the wino did not share this optimism and he and his cohort began looking at ways to block progressive legislation. In fact, 
all legislation proposed by the president, even bills he and Republicans favored in the past. They became the party of no and accelerated donations to get their people elected locally. The day after the election, Joe called an all-hands meeting of his company's employees and warned, if Obama socializes medicine as he promised, you can all go on the government plan. Over in Texas, Jenna Lee was dubious about the election, while Harlan was downright worried the president-elect would confiscate his guns. A fourth grade homeroom teacher in Jenny Lee's district had the audacity to write these words on her smart board. Kalu kole o frabjes day, for children to see when they arrived at school. When one of the parents accused the teacher of being a liberal, she explained the words were from, from the Jabberwocky poem that was the day's English lesson. The inauguration was celebrated by a dozen balls with a ball for everyone. A hip-hop ball featured Beyonce, and a servicemen's ball honored those who would serve the new commander-in-chief. There was an LGBTQ ball held in the closet, in the Capitol's closet, but the president was undecided about whether to, to attend and missed it as he weighed options. Let's have a winos ball, said Paul, who invited everyone in the neighborhood. He tweeted at the White House about his plans and set aside his favorite barrel should POTUS and FLOTUS arrive. Joe, Cougar, Steph, Merlo, Mac, and the other winemaking neighbors arrived at the impromptu winos ball to celebrate or mourn the inauguration of the people's savior or the great Satan. Each carried a bottle of wine concealed in a paper bag to share without revealing the identity until all wines were judged. The cougar brought a 10-year-old Chateau Montalena Cabernet, Joe, a $3,500 Burgundy, before Obama levies a wealth tax on luxuries. Steph and John, who had recently toured Australia, brought a bottle of Penfold's Grange, while Paul, whose monthly mortgage was greater than Joe's wine, had enough money for a bottle of two-buck chuck, which cost less than what he paid for a cork, label, and bottle. How can anyone make money selling wine for $2? To save money, he pulled a bottle of that Petit Verdot from the barrel and wrapped it in brown paper, one of the best labels he ever designed. He whetted his guests' desires by telling them his selection was the most expensive wine they ever tasted by those assembled. True, if you amortize the property cost over the number of good bottles he produced. Matt brought a bottle of Merlot. Paul didn't shave and smeared charcoal in his cheeks in the spirit of hobo chic. While John brought a bottle of $2 wine as a sign of the frugal times and to see if any of the aficionados chose it as their favorite in blind tasting. With the bottles halfway gone, they tried to open a bottle without a corkscrew and John took off his shoe and banged the heel against the bottle's bottom and sure enough, the cork started to budge and he pulled it out by hand. Paul posted a photo and comment on the Facebook live feed. Wino's ball underway. We're saving the best barrel for POTUS. Please join us. When they uncovered the labels, they were surprised to see the local Petit Verdot held its own against the famous wines, every guest remarking how floral it was. Although the guests of honor were tied up in Washington, D.C., Bluey and Paul danced as they watched the balls unfold, one after the other, on a computer screen. They had cut the cable and had no TV reception. Unknown to Paul, his messages sent in jest to the commander-in-chief did not go unnoticed, and not because all electronic communications were under surveillance. A White House staffer named Keisha, responsible for monitoring the social media feed, grew up with a dog and an appreciation for wine. And now that her life was devoted to supporting the communication needs of the West Wing 15 hours a day, owning a rambunctious dog that demanded as much attention as the president wasn't an option. She fed her canine compulsion by taking an interest in this bluey character, lured by the handsome dog and scenic photos of the patriotic citizens' countryside vineyard. Keisha, the eldest daughter of Leroy, was born in St. Louis and attended high school in L.A. suburbs. She was an economics policy walk researching health care policy and mortgage relief. She noted Paul's pleas for the bully pulpit to bully down interest rates to put more spending power in people's hands. There could be a story, an event, an opportunity here someday, she thought, and followed their adventures online. After the revelers departed, Paul looked out the picture window of his house and saw Al Gore and Karl Rove dancing 
And the owl and the pussy danced to their heart's content. They did, they did. And the owl and the pussycat danced. And at the end of the evening, when all were exhausted, the cat lay down next to the dog. How did Miguel Rodrigo and the other day laborers spend the inauguration? While their patron watched the inaugural dress on TV, except for Joe the wino who couldn't bear seeing it and moved the TV from the break room of his office into a closet so his employees wouldn't lose, um, they streamed it on computer screens on their desk, whispering amongst themselves, Obama was the smartest, most intelligent person ever elected. Um, Rodrigo and company worked as Miguel supervised with the corona. It was just another day. The next morning, as younger members of the White House staff were dragging, Keisha suggested to the communications chief, the president has got to get and spend some time with real people. Take a look at this guy who held a wino's ball. File that idea for when we need it, he replied. First, we need to find POTUS, a dog. Sixteen months later, in the spring of 2010, it was opening day in the vineyard when anything could happen. Buds were popping. Shoots were shooting. The fragile shoots of spring will become strong in summer, as sure as cars will roll off factory assembly lines, concrete foundations laid, wooden frames hammered for new houses, and store shelves stocked with inventory, discerned Paul. The dormant economy woke from its slumber, and green shoots reached the first wire, and Paul and the other winemakers saw it first. Before the vines grow out of control, the Federal Reserve will step in and cut back irrigation to control inflation and the vineyard and economy will grow in balance. Paul witnessed the first shoots. A new spring, a new vintage, opening day, all contained within the tiny bud of a dormant vine. He packaged a bottle of Petit Verdot, women's favorite, another bottle for the messenger, and a special blend for a special recipient. And with the foolish audacity of a winemaker, isn't making wine the oper operational definition of a fool, he picked up his pen and wrote, Dear First Lady and Mr. President, For months, there has been nothing but dreary news in the media about the economy. No city or town has been passed over by the damage and pain. Even in our semi-rural, gentlewoman and gentleman farmer community, we have seen neighbors' homes foreclosed, families uprooted, shops on Main Street abandoned. I am reminded of what scripture tells us about the biblical patriarch Joseph and his dreams. He foresaw seven years of famine, followed by seven years of abundance. In ancient Egypt, after seven years of drought, the rains returned and so did the crops. And from the depths of the 1932 depression, the United States emerged to become the world's greatest economic power. The lessons from the past speak to our time. We will rise again. We come and go, but the land is always here, always serene. You should visit this area sometime and experience it, to park your burdens at the entrance for a day and reconnect with nature and the earth. In the vineyard among the vines, there are answers to all dilemmas. All things have their seasons. After midnight's darkness, the sun will rise again. After winter's cold, spring's thaw will follow. We spent the cold, dark winter pruning vines, cutting back, cutting expenses as well. In winter, the vineyard is barren. Just as the sun must rise and the swallows return to Capistrano, this recession, it too shall pass. Yesterday in the vineyard, I came across a shoot, a green shoot with fragile green leaves, signaling the start of spring. Then I saw another, and another, green shoots everywhere. Mr. President, just as there are green shoots in the vineyard, there are green shoots sprouting in the economy. The recession is ending. Growth is on the way. Stay the course and keep the faith. We are keeping hope alive. About that wine I gave you, the first bottle is Petit Verdot, the most fragrant wine known to womankind and dogkind a wine made for fine ladies. It is for Michelle. The second bottle is a blend made from all the different grapes of our vineyard, some Petit Syrah and Petit Verdot and Zinfandel and Tempranillo and Grenache and Alianico. 
The recipe is a little bit of this, a little bit of that. This is the Ellis Island of wines, an assembly of our leftovers, our poor, our huddled masses, grapes yearning to be free, a melting pot, a kitchen soup, and the result? Bluey the Aussie gave it six licks, the most I've ever seen, and it is perhaps the best wine we've ever made. Just as the good Lord brought people from all over the world to this country to make America the beautiful, we have taken grapes from each corner of our vineyard and carboys from all wines from all corners of the winery to create this blend, which we henceforth call President's Cuive. May God bless your presidency in the United States. Sincerely yours, Paul, the winemaker. He sent the letter with three bottles of wine to Keisha, whom Paul had connected with on Facebook, with a request to, to pass it on to the president and keep the extra bottle for herself. Two weeks later, Paul received an email from Keisha thanking him for the gift and saying the president was grateful. She included a link to the president's weekly radio address with the suggestion, Paul, listen. And Paul heard Obama proclaim green shoots were sprouting up all over the economy and declared an end to the recession. After the 2010 midterm elections when the Democrats got whooped to Joe's jubilation, the president felt a need to get out of Washington to reconnect with and bring his message direct to the people. Keisha proposed an event to bring together non-politicians, real people with opposing views to see where they could find common ground. The president was due for a fundraising trip to California to refill coffers depleted by the midterms and was itching to play golf at Torrey Pines. A presidential visit to San Diego made sense. That's a Republican stronghold, said the director of communications. Are you nuts? I've been researching a con congressional district where there's a pocket of support for the president. It's a perfect setting for an event, Keisha countered. It's scenic, and one of the residents is Joe the Wino. What a work of art. He's donated millions to support Sarah Palin and the Tea Party. There's a vineyard there owned by a dog, an Australian shepherd, almost as smart as POTUS. Vineyard owned by a dog, the director asked with an arched eyebrow. His owner is named Paul. Seems to be a down-to-earth sympath guy sympathetic to our message. You said you wanted real people. The president could tour the vineyards. Think of the photo op, POTUS nurturing green shoots of the economy, and meeting with migrant laborers too. To build closer ties with the Latino community and support for his immigration policies. Exactly. And I think we can flip the district. I like this, said the communications chief. Ever since the beer summit last year, the American Association of Wine Distributors has been after me to organize a wine summit. Did Jessica Fackhandler promise you a date in exchange for a wine summit? The director smiled and replied, she's very persuasive. Jessica was the executive director of the Distributors Association, whose charm and powers of persuasion were legendary. Imagine the scene, the communicator in chief bringing all sides to the table to unite a divided community. Joe the Wino and the Tea Party on one side, the winemaker Paul and a representative of day laborers on the other. What about Flotus? Michelle loves wine. They can make it a date day as they tour the vineyard. And Bo? And Toto too? Mocked the intern? Yes, and Bobo too. Go ahead and set it up. Keisha contacted Paul with the news, who enlisted Joe, pleased to be given a national platform for a second 15 minutes of fame. Miguel and the bishop also agreed to participate, so that a trinity was represented, the left wing, the right wing, and the angel's wing. The White House communications team welcomed an opportunity for Bo to engage in dog diplomacy. The American people love dogs, at least over 50% did, and canine affection crossed political boundaries. But the divide between Republicans and Democrats was worse than dog lovers versus cat lovers. Could a glass of wine, the charmer in chief, and their dogs elevate civil discourse and bring the nation closer together? When the presidential visit to Hidden Hills was announced, the press christened it the Wine Summit. In the plush, in the plush Washington, D.C. offices of the American Association of Wine Distributors, Champagne, with a capital C, C because it was the real deal from France, corks popped and shot down a chandelier in the boardroom, and the bubbly flowed as the staff watched the news on a 96-inch flat screen. 
They had a strong horse in this race, with Joe the Wino, a surrogate for their conservative views, although Jessica Fackhandler became wary of Paul after reviewing his social media feed. She would keep an eye on him. A week before the summit, a Secret Service advance team scoured the area to remove security risk. They reviewed the social media feeds of all the neighbors, spending an unusually long time oogling the cougar selfies, who was alerted by Joe's history of inflammatory remarks. He was the first visited by FBI agents, who quickly determined he wasn't a physical threat to the president. However, they confiscated pistols and rifles from Paul's neighbor, who used his backyard as a firing range in violation of county statutes, requiring 2,000 feet distance between residences. Joe notified Tea Party officials and the San Diego Union Tribune, which wrote an editorial denouncing Obama for confiscating people's guns in violations of the Second Amendment right to bear arms. When Harlan saw this news on his preppers' Facebook page, he got all up in arms convinced Obama was planning an attack on Texas to disarm it. Jenna Lee told her husband to shut up and stop believing everything he read on the interlet. How, you, how could you believe this, Harlan? Even my sixth graders wouldn't fall for such horse dookie, she said, putting him in his place. The Secret Service inspected Paul's winery, taping black plastic trash bags against the windows to block the view of sharpshooting assassins. They insisted he remove boxes stocked to the ceiling, filled with 45 years of elementary school report cards, college blue books, textbooks, research papers, notebooks, all the books he had read, and bird sketches, so a ninja couldn't hide behind the stacks and strike the first couple. Ten years before the president's visit, Sheila discovered a snapshot of Christine and threw every photo album of Paul's into the trash. When Paul returned from the office, he was so furious Atmospheric atoms were on the verge of splitting with potential devastating results. At the moment of impending explosion, the point of no return, a fight to end all fights, with Sheila just as angry shouting epithets, Paul backed down as the Dalai Lama's teachings entered his head. His photos were just stuff, physical things, possessions, with no lasting meaning, and he let them go. From that day, Paul stepped off the racetrack of materialism, so that if a fire approached his neighborhood, as certain as green shoots in spring, he would leave, as material possessions were not worth third-degree burns. When the Secret Service insisted he move the memories he carried as a snail carries its home, including books by the aforementioned Dalai Lama, Paul didn't care. It was time to clean up the garage, and the President's visit was the catalyst for getting the chore done. Besides, they needed more space for all the wine they were making. He sorted through the stacks, kept a few books he moved inside to reread when he retired, uh, donated to a bookstore what he'd never read again, and moved the remaining boxes to Chateau Bluey at the top of the hill. The Secret Service selected the Yellow Room, decorated in provincial shades of lemon and sunflower in fields of hay as the Hold Room, in case POTUS was called upon to deal with a crisis. They ran cables from the yellow room to microwave receivers they installed on the roof for encrypted satellite communications. From the roof, agents surveyed below for possible sniper threats, taking longer than expected as they observed the cougar in the valley soaking up vitamin D in the privacy of her back porch. Years later, on a visit to Obama's presidential museum and library, I found the day's official schedule in the archives. When Obama started calling Paul bootlegger, the tag is signed by the Secret Service. The name stuck. Here's an excerpt. 0930. Arrived Miramar Air Base on Air Force One. 0945. Greet Top Gun Commander. 0100. POTUS FLOTUS FITUS board limousine. Drive to Bloomer Winery. 1045. Arrive Bloomer Winery. Receiving line. Greet host family. Bootlegger host. Wine dog. Australian Shepherd. Vineyardista, hostess, and guests including Pirate, Miguel, Migrant Labor Leader Boss, Rich Man, Joe the Wino, Businessman and Republican Fundraiser, Purple Collar, Bishop of San Diego, and selected neighbors including Cougar, Chicano Chick, Mr. Fixit, Merlot Man, others. 11, 11.30. First family vineyard and winery tour on property led by Boop Lager. Plant ceremonial vines. Golf swing practice with lefty flop. 11.30 to 12.30, lunch inside house. 12.30 to 
1,400 hours. Wine Summit Forum on Terrace. Attending. POTUS Purple Collar Pirate Richman Bootlegger. 1430. Depart by Marine Force One for Torrey Pines Golf Course for golf with names redacted. To keep us and adversaries guessing, we didn't know if Obama would arrive by air, land, or sea, the latter a theoretical possibility since there were amphibious landing craft at Camp Pendleton that could be seen from Paul's property by telescope. Air traffic control implemented a no-fly zone except for helicopters based at Pendleton that patrolled the skies, their distant their distant hum piercing the peaceful scenery. The 15 was closed from El Norte Parkway to San Luis Rey, angering motorists, but to many it was just another sig alert for the 15, a parking lot during rush hour, although traffic congestion eased during the recession. Three days before the president's arrival, Paul's Buddhist leanings regarding possessions were tested when the water heater in the winery, formerly known as the garage, leaked sending water onto the floor absorbed by cardboard boxes. A dry box is strong and supports more than 150 pounds, but wet cardboard is weaker than a spent erection, and although the flood wasn't a threat to the house, it was a threat to the wine. With his new Washington connections, Paul thought about calling FEMA to help, but it might take them days to respond. Worse, they might condemn the property the government having powers of condemnation and exclusion in an emergency, preventing him from returning to save his own property. Paul and Sheila scrambled, saved the towering stacks of wine, forming a two-person brigade, carrying boxes one at a time to higher elevations. Sheila shrieked as she uncovered Templeton the Rat's winter sanctuary, abandoned except for a black widow, and littered with carcasses of three months' meals of roly-polies, stink bugs, crickets, covered like an ice cream cone with chocolate sprinkles of dried rat feces. After Paul dispatched the spider, there was only one thing to do before Food and Drug Administration officials condemned the property. Clean it up. He put on a mask. He put on eye goggles and rubber gloves and swept the rat's nest mask. He poured non-chlorinated TSP cleaner into a bucket of water, took one of the dog's towels as a rag, got on his knees and washed. (laughs) The white towel blackened as he wiped, and as he prepared to sterilize after he cleaned. Friends, beware of sterilizing your winery with bleach because you don't want the stench of cardboard infused chlorine seeping into your wine. He took a fresh rag infused with citric acid and wiped, and as he wiped, the rag moving in a rhythm like windshield wiper blades, He imagined they were on his knees, washing the bare feet of the president, soon to be his guest. Paul joyfully cleaned the winery floor, and he and Obama dodged the hantavirus bullet. Never before had their winery been so clean, and Paul hadn't seen Sheila this happy in months. With the press crawling into the quiet community like a horde of ants looking to feed on mealy bugs dew, Carrie Ann postponed her full frontal vitamin D absorption ritual because paparazzi with long-range lenses were searching for racy photo opportunities. The Secret Service played a game rating her photos and videos. If you throw out the high, one gave her a 10, and the low, one ranked her 5, saying she was too old. She averaged 8.3. If Carrie Ann had known which agent considered her beyond prime, she would have fucked his brains out to teach him a lesson he'd never forget. Making wine is a three, three-wing circus, and the property took on the look as the driveway was tented as a security measure al- along with the house's terrace. Canvas was also strung along the poplar trees bordering the road, blocking the views of anyone below who tried to gaze up. The big day was a media circus, with Joe the wino re- reliving the attention he enjoyed during the 2010 elections when he asserted government regulations and high corporate taxes kept him from expanding business and creating jobs sorely needed with so many people out of work. He used his contacts at Fox News and the Tea Party to turn out the conservative media. Mrs. Palin, in search of a new job, made overtures about attending the summit, and Paul said he would be honored to host the former vice presidential candidate, so long as her participation was balanced by Tina Fey as mistress of ceremonies. Ms. Fey ne- never responded, so Paul thought it was better Ms. Palin stay away. 
I can see Alaska from my house, Paul told a reporter from NBC News, hinting it would be almost like having the Alaska governor seated at the table. Moreover, Joe, who almost succeeded putting her into the White House, could, rep could vigorously represent her positions. A summit that included Joe, the president, the bishop, and Miguel at the table would be enough, without the glamour of Mrs. Palin and Mrs. Fay, much to Paul's chagrin, as he thought they were the hottest candidates ever, real and imagined, and, th and though he wouldn't vote for either, after a glass of wine, or even without, he would kiss either if invited. And Miguel? The nation was up in arms about illegal immigrants, their health care cost, not to mention the health care cost of the rest of us, and their unemployment, or their employment, not to mention the unemployment of the rest of us, searching for solutions. And San Diego, sharing a border, economic, cultural, and family ties with Mexico, was a good place to look for answers. Paul noticed convoys of vigilantes, many funded by Joe, following the coyote paths in the valleys below his house, headed south to secure the border. Although billed as a wine summit, Miguel made his preference for Corona known, but the National Association of Merlot Makers, who had launched a counteroffensive after being blindsided by the insult-slinging Pinot Pussy of Sideways, persuaded Miguel to request a glass of Merlot. Miguel proved his loyalty to the local community by eating his own dog food, ordering wine made by Merlot Mac, chuckling as he requested a cute White House staffer, make it fine Merlot. Mas fina, please. <laughs> Jenna Lee was excited for Carrie Ann, uh, approved for the guest list, and called to learn more. Sugar? Is it true what they say about the Secret Service agents? If I told you, it wouldn't be secret, would it? Carrie Ann answered. Oh my God, you didn't, you know, did you? Jenna Lee, stop beating around my bush. You want to know, did I fuck them, right? Now, it wouldn't be a secret service, would it, if I told you? So let's just say the president needs to strengthen his security. Paul noticed an aircraft carrier cruising the waters between Cap Pendleton and Catalina Island. Security scanners and metal detectors were set up at the property's entrance, which all guests were required to pass. The secret service used their authority to provide an extra pat-down screening for Carrie Ann. They confiscated Paul's flask of homemade brandy as a liquid explosive. He volunteered to drink to prove it wasn't. The SS enjoyed it at their after party that evening, according to a reliable source from the neighborhood, not to be revealed who was there. The presidential visit brought all kinds of people out of the woodwork. Hermit crazy ladies painted signs, welcome President Obama, nailing them to poles at the bottom of Paul's road. A protest area was set aside at the base of the mountain near the intersection of the 15 and Deer Springs Road. Belmarie Winery, which offered a good view for the protesters, offered free wine tastings to registered Republicans if they showed their Republican ID and to one, anyone else over 21. The California TTB, conducting a sting operation against the winery to trick it into serving minors, declared an unofficial truce for the week. Students from the University of California, San Diego, strung a large banner from the bridge over the interstate, Make Wine, Not War. Others carried signs, Out of Iraq Now, and Close Guantanamo. Some protesters purchased vegetables from the organic produce stand at the, at the bottom of the hill and stood behind birthers carrying signs, Show Us Your Birth Certificate, and threw eggs, tomatoes, cauliflower, and avocados at the long black limousine. The president arrived by land. None penetrated its armor. The limo carried and slalom five miles into the hills until it reached Bloomerill Vineyard's entrance. The driveway was too steep and narrow for the vehicle, so the president, first lady, and Beau emerged at the cul-de-sac, and Bluey barked in sheep herding mode to welcome them and make clear to Beau who was top dog. Bluey announced Bo's arrival to neighborhood dogs who rushed to slip through the neighbor's locked gate, unforeseen by the Secret Service. Hey man, how you doing? said a jovial president as he walked up to Paul with fist pump and handshake. The Secret Service tells me they have a special name for you, Bootlegger. Let's see if I can live up to that, rep replied Paul. Mr. President, 
we welcome you, the First Lady and the First Dog, to Blue Merle Country. Bluer, Bluey, enamored by the First Lady who wore a bright yellow dress, was taken to the other side of the vineyard to keep him from lunging at her crotch, where he and Bo hit it off, running around with the other dogs. Thank you for the letter and the wine you sent, Obama said. It's encouraging to see other parts of the country turning around. Let me show you around, said Paul, who led them uphill. They started at the Via della Rosa, where, Paul, where the bishop noticed carved wooden figures nailed to posts signifying stations of the cross. Paul paused at, paused at each vineyard block to explain the varietal, pointing out differences in leaf patterns, cluster shapes, and berry sizes. There was a lot of work that went into this, observed the president. Yes, sir, and satisfaction. I suppose George Washington and Thomas, Thomas Jefferson found satisfaction in working the land when their crops turned out well. They had slaves and you have me, Miguel interjected. Gracias Sanchez Panza, said Paul, referring to Don Quixote's sidekick. Paul turned to Obama and continued, after a hard day's work, it's refreshing to take in these views. Working among the vines, everything becomes clear. I invite you to take a few moments of quiet time to find clarity and answers to the country's challenges and hope you leave here re-energized. As Obama listened, he imagined hitting a hole in one at Torrey Pines and getting 10 million people back to work. Let's pick avocados for Sasha and Malaya, Paul suggested. The president and first lady twisted the green softball softball sized fruits off a tree. I've never seen avocados this big, said Michelle. It's a reed. The flavor is good. It's ripe when you shake it and the seed inside rattles. Cut it in half and pour a little olive oil into the avocado's cup and sprinkle it with Hawaiian red clay sea salt. It's delicious and on the menu for today's trees. Speaking of olive oil, said Paul, pointing to the grove of piccoline and arbequina trees, this is our Mount of Olives. Bishop, you'll appreciate we created a theological garden. Paul pointed to Golgotha and the cross of Calvary at the summit, and beneath it, the, a cave symbolizing the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre. The president pulled the ripe olive from a tree and popped it into his mouth before Paul could stop him. Damn, that's the bitterest thing I've ever tasted, Obama said, spitting the remnants into the ground. I was about to warn you not to eat it, said Paul. It needs to be cured. Don't worry, we have a state grown and cured olives on today's menu. What are these flowers? The president asked. They're proteas. Some look like yellow pin cushions. Their origin is South Africa, where they grow like weeds. The climate here is similar. Why don't we cut some for Michelle and the girls? You really put a lot of work into this place, the, mich- the bishop said to Paul. Gracias, Monsignor, said Miguel. Most of the neighbors have put put a lot of work into their properties as well. Right, Joe? Said Paul. Joe's place is magnificent. It's a shame to see people lose their houses. It's even happening here. We're looking at things we can do to keep people in their homes, Obama said. That seems like a good idea, said Joe, but it's complicated. There are legal contracts involved. The best way to solve the problem is for homeowners to declare bankruptcy and start over and for banks to foreclose. With this with the slate wiped clean, houses will sell at market value. You know, Paul said to the president, we bought this property near the height of the market and there's a pretty large mortgage on it, at least large for us. Interest rates have dropped, but since the house's value is underwater, we can't refinance. I'm not asking for a handout. All I'm saying is my interest rate were lowered, we'd have more money to spend on other things and that would be good for the economy. Right now, all our money goes to mortgage interest and Miguel over there. Why don't you pay me as much as you pay him? Sheila asked. I do more work than he does. And how much do you earn working at Vineyard? Flotus asked Sheila. About as much as the first lady, she replied, to which the president and Michelle paid zero for her duties, chuckled. There's much more to see, said Paul, changing the topic. Bluey, go to gazebo. They walked over, they walked along the Great Wall of Merol behind the trotting Asi and Bo, crossing the Zinfandel block to a flat area with a gazebo from where they could see mountains, valleys, Camp Pendleton, and the ocean. Do you have snakes on the property? Michelle asked. 
There's always a serpent in the vineyard of Eden and the corridors of Washington, replied Paul. Don't worry. Bluey is trained to detect snakes. If he smells one, we'll know about it before it reaches us. I told the snakes you were coming and asked them to stay away, Sheila said. You'll be fine. Paul said to the president, One of my favorite memories of President Reagan uh, was him hiking through his Santa Barbara ranch and crushing rattlers with his boot heel. No problem, said Obama. I'm better with my feet than Reagan ever was. Paul pointed to the horizon. I can see Sarah Palin's Alaska from my house and Russia and all the way to Japan and China. You have a wonderful place, said the bishop. It's, God it's God's country, said Paul. The president was a Pied Piper, followed by a pack of neighborhood dogs that barked and ran circles around each other. A little feisty Jack Russell Terrier led the dogs and invited Bo to play. Even Joe's Weimariner and Miguel's Pit Bull joined in. There were no purebreds, purebreds or mutts, no AKC pedigrees or rescues, no rich or poor. They were just dogs, black, white, yellow, brown, red and blue, all playing together, the canine coalition. And for a moment, there were no Republicans, no, no Democrats, just people and dogs. The president petted all the dogs, then took a frisbee and winged it. The disc soared like a hawk riding thermals for half a mile all the way to the property's bottom, where the dogs sprinted to catch it. The Jack Russell outlet Bluey and the others to snag it. We wanted to let you roll up your sleeves, dig in, get your hands dirty, and experience a little vineyard work, said Paul. We've got three vines for you to plant around the gazebo. The first is a Spanish varietal. Tempranillo, to honor the Spaniards who planted the first grapes in this area. The second is Alexander Muscat, widely planted here last century, and the third is Champagne Grape, because my wife has been after me for years to plant Champagne Grape, said Paul, handing the President and Michelle a shovel. As the guests inserted the vines into pre-dug holes, Miguel showed them how to form a ball of dirt and place the roots over it. Paul noticed two secret service agents on his roof and sharpshooters, the kind with rifles, not the pest carrying Pierce's disease, on the roofs of houses below. If I give them a bottle of wine, would they pick off some squirrels? Paul handled Michelle a hose to soak the vines. When they finished, Paul announced, since you like golf, I asked my fellow San, Di San Diegan to set up a hole so you could warm up before you round at Torrey Pines, introducing everyone to Phil Mickelson. My afternoon schedule was supposed to be a secret, said POTUS. A lucky guess, replied Paul. And with Phil, who had groomed a tea box on Gazebo Hill, and a landscape green with a cup and a pin flag 175, miles, 175 yards away. It was as scenic as any hole on the PGA Tour. Just one request, Mr. President, said Paul. Please don't hit the aircraft carrier. I don't want them returning fire with a cruise missile. Obama took a few practice swings with the club handed him to by Keisha. Paul observed the president, had a good swing, and gave and gave a few tips to Phil, who was working on his. Paul handed Obama a golf ball with Bluey's logo on it, saying, This is my favorite ball. I know you won't shank it into the canyon. Take the honors and swing away. The president set the ball atop a tee, addressed it, took a deep breath, and swung a controlled swing. Swoosh ping! The impact of the ball, combined with the swoosh of the club, triggered Bluey, who barked in alarm. That dog hated golf. Paul could never stream the Masters, because the sound of a drive set Bluey off. The president's shot followed the arc of a perfect parabola, landing on the green. Nice shot! The, onlook the onlookers clapped. Let it be a good sign for the country, Paul said. Let's go for a quick tour of the winery, and then have a bite to eat. As they walked downhill, Sheila veered in the direction and to the kitchen, and Paul volunteered to enter first, enter first in case any ninjas waited in ambush. Paul noticed a military officer with a large black case. Is that the nuclear football? Paul asked the president. Heck no, he's carrying my honest tea. Paul invited the commander-in-chief to sniff the barrel since he couldn't drink on the job. The president bent over and inhaled. Come on back when you retire, and we'll taste them all, just like old bulls, just like old bulls, said Paul. Deal, said the man. If you retire your first term, you can drink all the wine you want sooner, suggested Joe. Uh, thanks, Joe. 
I'll think about retiring when my work is finished. Hey, thanks for approving our winery application, Paul said to the president. The TTB staff were terrific. The first thing I learned after becoming a professional winemaker was how to spit wine to taste without swallowing, because if you drink 10 different wines in 10 minutes, you're looking at a DUI. Sheila, who hated to cook, insisted on having the summit catered. Three days earlier, the caterer, the Gourmand Francaise, was raided for hiring illegals. Sheila rose to the occasion, claiming it would just be as easy cooking, cooking as for the harvest crew, and Carrie Ann and Steph leaned in. 24 hours before the guests arrived, Sheila started cooking her well-tasted dishes and without stopping to sleep. Um, at lunchtime, the plates, plates of food covered every table, counter, and desk in the house. No one ever left her home hungry, and she paired each estate and she paired estate wines with each dish the media and NGOs could sample. Sheila shrieked when she saw a glass falling to the ground and a vision of throwing out all the food flashed before her. She didn't know the Secret Service had substituted plastic for crystal as a security measure, and she was astonished and relieved when the cup didn't shatter. Michelle's condition for attending the summit was permission to drink one glass. Paul poured her Petit Verdot, the same wine he and Bluey were making when they first heard President Obama speak. Barack, honey, this smells so good I could wear it, she said, placing a few drops behind her ears. After lunch, the guests gathered on the terrace where the bishop recited an invocation and the wine summit officially began and the harmony of the day evaporated with the spirit of the bishop's prayer. Mr. President, Joe began respectfully, Obamacare is a job killer. As a business owner and job creator, I know firsthand forcing company owners to pay more for employee insurance will raise costs and result in less hiring. If you want companies to hire more people, repeal Obamacare and reduce the corporate tax rate. What about the deficit? asked the president. When the number of tax paying employees increases, tax receipts increase and their deficit will decrease. Look at the economic growth under Reagan spurred by tax cuts. Joe, responded Obama. When President Bush cut taxes, how many more folks did you hire? After an awkward silence, the president continued. From what I see, the only thing tax cuts did was put more money into the pockets of business owners and increase the budget deficit. Moreover, in, 20, in 2008, after a year of record sales and profits, you laid off 24% of your company's staff. It was a preemptive first strike. Is that the Bush doctrine for business? Asked the president. Look, uh, Joe, I'm not convinced company owners like you would hire more people with the next tax cut. For sure, the deficit would increase. It sounds like voodoo economics all over again. I want to see more data. Perhaps the bishop, interjected Paul, sees a middle ground to this policy conundrum. Work is important for human dignity, said the bishop. Since the time of Adam and Eve, people have had to work for their livelihood. Any responsible government policies that increase employment are a good thing. I respectfully disagree, countered Joe. It's one thing for the government to create a healthy framework for businesses to operate and create employment, but it's better for the private sector to create jobs through the market rather than wasteful government spending. Look at the trillion dollars the government just pumped into the economy. If that had money had been put into the people's hands to spend and not by the government, the impact would have been much greater. The president nodded attentively. What will we do as a society, asked the bishop, when artificial intelligence improves and machines can perform many jobs? How will society organize itself as people's jobs are replaced by machines? That's an interesting question, said the president. Fortunately, that time is far off in the future. I'm concerned about the millions of people who need a job now. To continue the bishop's line of inquiry into how society organizes itself, said Paul, what moral obligation does the government have to provide health care to its citizens? Not at all, interjected Joe. America was founded on the principle of self-reliance. People are responsible for taking care of themselves and managing their own health. 
What about those born with an ailment? Is that their fault? Should they be denied insurance and care? Asked the bishop. Joe, there's something I'd like to ask you, the bishop continued. Business leaders are all for free enterprise and prefer government take a laissez-faire approach to the economy. Why is it that the owners of the San Diego Chargers demand public funds to subsidize the new football stadium? To me, it seems our city's scarce discretionary funds could be better used to help the homeless become independent, to assist at-risk children grow into productive citizens, and for other pressing needs. Is subsidizing a pr private business to build a sports stadium the best use of public funds? Well, at least we fixed, fixed the college football playoff system, interjected Obama. A new stadium for San Diego is a local issue beyond the scope of federal government. Let's steer the conversation back to federal programs. Why don't you give me more money to buy a new truck, asked Miguel. And why is that? Mr. President, why don't you just condemn Miguel's truck, suggested Paul. It's so old, it's a road hazard and a polluter. If you give me an incentive to buy a new truck, it will help the auto companies, Miguel said. We did that already. Don't you remember cash for clunkers? I, I couldn't buy a truck then. I had no money. I guess you could buy one now since you took all my money, Miguel said. Paul said to Miguel. It's something we could look at again, Obama said to be polite. We threw a lifeline to the auto industry and it worked. We're glad to, save De We're glad to see Detroit on the upswing. That's what's wrong with government spending in this administration, said Joe. Increasing the federal deficit to help Miguel buy a, buy a vehicle he's going to purchase anyhow when his truck dies. That's not wise. That's not an investment. Let me tell you about the real world, said Miguel. Joe talks about buying new things. My car won't die. I'll just keep fixing it and it'll run forever. We Mexicanos can fix anything. And Miguel whispered to Paul, you can't fix shit, amigo. If you're still looking at pumping money into the economy, that's an investment. Why not put solar panels on every roof here in Southern California, suggested Paul. Keisha, write that down. Okay, here's something we can agree on, said Paul. Joe, help me out here. Mr. President, the Clean Water Act is killing us. It's turning us into criminals. Look outside at the ivy and the bushes. During harvest, we pick grapes and put them in containers and carry them to the winery. We used to wash the containers with a hose over the ivy. What? The government says that's water pollution. Why is it a crime to water your plants if the water has a little grape juice in it? How is that polluting anything? It's a perfect example of too many government regulations stifling business, Joe added. We'll look into it, said the president. Keisha, make a note. Mr. President, here's another thing I'd like you to ask to look at where Joe and I agree, said Paul. Since you're a constitutional scholar, this is right up your alley. Doesn't the Commerce Clause of the Constitution allow Congress to regulate commerce between the states. Our winery is licensed by the federal government to make and sell wine, yet many states don't allow us to ship wine direct to their residents. Those states are interfering in, in interstate commerce. Isn't that unconstitutional? What about the 21st Amendment, replied the president, who knew his constitution? The what? asked Paul. You know, the amendment that repealed prohibition. Yes, and? It gave states the right to limit or prohibit the import of alcohol. Sounds to me like a violation of the Commerce Clause. Look, uh, Paul, I like the way you think. I know Michelle likes your wine and we'd like to order some. Keisha, can you work up an order? He can ship to Camp David, but not Virginia. Why's that? Virginia law. The president became serious and looked Paul in the eye. Uh, I understand you would advocate shipping wine across state lines. I hope you're not breaking any laws. Or my, I may have to ask the Justice Department and J. Edgar over at FBI to investigate you. I heard you're really good putting people at ease, Paul replied. I think I just stained my pants. Keisha, said the president, let's look into the interstate wine shipments and let's order a case of wine from each winery here and have it shipped to Camp, Camp Pendleton for the upcoming meeting with the French president. I'd like to show him how, how well grape grows in America. We haven't discussed the elephant in the room, said Joe. What's that? asked Obama. Illegal immigration. Why doesn't the government enforce our immig immigration laws? Uh, we do, Joe. Look how many illegals we've deported since I assumed office. We need to send more back. 
You say you want to create shovel-ready jobs. Illegals take away work from American citizens. They lower the quality of education in our schools. They increase health care costs for all of us when they go to emergency rooms without insurance. And they taint our elections by voting le illegally. That's why California always votes blue. Uh, what are we supposed to do with the people here working hard and contributing to society? Send them back and then build a wall, like the Great Wall of China, to keep them out. We should be building bridges with our neighbors in Tijuana, not walls, said the bishop. The only bridges, bridges being built are underground tunnels for trafficking drugs, people, and terrorists, said Joe. We need to defend our borders, Miguel interjected. You guys should know that we got a lot of people in my community upset with the police. It's gotten to the point where we don't trust any police and we don't want any police near us. A city shouldn't be responsible for enforcing the federal immigration laws of the United States, said Obama. The city is creating a situation where we fear talking to police, said Miguel. And I'm not talking about legals, even me. I'm a U.S. citizen. But if I go to the cops to report something, they're going to ask for my driver's license. What if I forgot that? They'll throw me in jail. That's going to that's gonna hurt law enforcement when everyone is afraid of police. Look, uh, Joe, Obama said. I agree with you, we must protect our border borders, and that's why I'm increasing Homeland Security's budget for border security. That's something we can agree on, said Joe. Joe, uh, tell me something. Where did you get the intel about terrorists infiltrating the country through Mexico? I read it in a Clancy novel. Everything Clancy writes comes true. Everyone knows the border is porous and people, shouldn't, and people who shouldn't be here are coming in. Clancy, huh? He's a lot better than Fox News, said Obama. If you get all your news from Fox, you're living on another planet. Uh, Bishop, for a political organization, the church, the church seems to be taking a stand offering sanctuary to illegal immigrants. The church's doors are open for all who seek refuge. We mustn't close our doors on political refugees, said the bishop. Before entering seminary, I served in the Peace Corps in El Salvador where my friend, the Archbishop Romero, was gunned down during worship services. When even the bishop of a country isn't safe, how are its people safe? I felt a moral obligation to assist Salvadoran refugees escape death squads and flee to the U.S. And you're right, many entered the country illegally, and we, shel we sheltered them in churches. And I'm glad we did. It was the right thing to do. If the government can't control the border, said Joe, a well-regulated well militia can, and it's in the Constitution. We can't have armed citizens taking justice into their own hands. We welcome the assistance and support of concerned citizens who want to assist the Border Patrol, but we can't have them carrying arms and arresting people. Let's set up a task force to work on this. What about the H HB1 visa program? How do you feel about legal immigration and bringing skilled people into the country? Hell yes, we need more software engineers and programmers, said Joe. We'll work to expand it, said the president, while increasing investment in schools. Our students are our future. There's not just a shortage of skilled workers in tech. There's a sort shortage of farm workers, too. How do you suggest we address it? Take all the people on welfare and food stamps and make them work on farms. And if there's still a shortage, then a guest worker program might work. What if we hit the demand side of the problem and increase enforcement and fine companies that hire illegals? That's a good start, said Joe. Hey, uh, Joe, good luck finding uh, people to take care of your vineyard, Miguel said. Uh, bootlegger, Obama said. We've already got an issue with you shipping wine across state lines. Are you hiring illegal aliens too? Mr. President, Paul re replied. A moment ago, you asked me a pointed question and I did number one in my pants. With your latest question, I just did number two. We don't hire any aliens. We hire human beings. I'm just jiving with you, man. Take it easy, Obama said. I've got something to add, said the bishop. After Jesus rose from the dead, his very first appearance to one of his followers was a gardener. Think about it. Jesu fucking Christo, thought Miguel. After a moment of reflection, the president spoke. There's something I'd like to ask the bishop. 
I hear you've been having a little trouble in your church about gay, gay marriage. Please share with us what you learned from your experience. The Lord brought his ministry to all people. If we focus on the mission of the church to bring God's grace to everyone, we wouldn't waste energy on political fights. Obama was still formulating his policy on the topic and listened intently. The bishop asked, Isn't it the government's role to create a legal framework to protect people from discrimination? What similarities do you see, Mr. President, between the struggle for civil rights and the struggle for gay rights? Joe the Wino detested the bishop almost as much as Obama and funded, a breakaway and funded breakaway churches that occupied property owned by the Diocese of San Diego. Before the president could answer, Joe jumped in. The next thing you know, homosexuals are going to get married in church. It's disgusting. Joe, you're a Christian, aren't you? asked the bishop. Yes, and the Bible says holy matrimony is between a man and a woman. If you change the words between a man and a woman to between two people, that would take care of that, Paul offered. Yeah, I get that, said Joe, but I don't understand man, men marrying men. Mr. President, I think the public is optimistic in looking for your leadership from, from your administration on this. What are your thoughts, Paul asked. Michelle and I know what it's like growing up with prejudice. I believe the role of government is to ensure all people are treated fairly without regard to their religion, race, gender, or sexual orientation. What about chicks with dicks who want to use the ladies' room, asked Miguel. Miguel, exclaimed Paul. That's all right, let him speak, said Obama. Man, ask the fucking dog over there for his opinion, said Miguel. Miguel, I'm sorry, apologized the pirate. Look at the fucking dogs! And it wasn't a figure of speech as Bo, who started by sniffing Bluey's butt then licking his willy wonker, had mounted Bluey from behind in the style of dogs. Canine psychologists said it was a display of dominance by Bo, tried to tell Bluey who was top dog. The Aussie was having none of it, which couldn't be printed by prudish English publications. Rumors began circulating the president's dog was gay. Any suspicions about Bluey's sexual preference were dispelled by the attention he paid to Flotus Flower. My position on this is still evolving, said Obama, who lowered his voice and continued. Since this is off the record, ask me this question during my second term, which Joe leaked to a Fox News reporter within five minutes of the president's departure, warning Obama was going to legalize same-sex marriage if re-elected. A president's schedule is strictly enforced, and at 14.30 hours, Keisha interrupted to call time. The president stood, invited the bishop to make a closing prayer, and all rose and bowed their heads. Today, the president talked about respect and how we should respectfully listen to each other. Let us agree to respectfully disagree about our differences in opinion. And let's take one step beyond respect. To love your neighbor. To love one another. Love solves all problems. I'm not talking about romance between two people who have fallen in, lo in love, but truly care caring for each other. Treating strangers, treating people different from yourself, as you would treat family members. Because we are all one human family. If we respect each other as members of the same family, the same community, and love each other, the power of love dissolves all differences, solves all problems. May peace be with you, be with each and every one of you, and may we all have the strength, wisdom, and courage to go forth to do the work God has given us to do. Amen. Amen. The host family escorted the first family uphill along the stone path to Gazebo Hill, repurposed into a helicopter pad where Marine One waited. As its rotor started, the president said to Paul, watch this, and the commander-in-chief ordered his dog to chase birds off the property lest they collide with the chopper's blades. Bluey, not to be outdone, joined the first dog in cleaning out birds when sh Paul shouted, bird check. Come back when your president 
come back after your presidency and we'll drink wine from the vines you planted today, said Paul. Six-year-old vines make great wine. Paul, Bluey, and Sheila took a selfie with the first family and Boa, and as Maureen one lifted, avocados, grapefruit, blood, or blood oranges, and olives were forced from their branches, which Miguel scooped up and took to his truck, and the helicopter flew towards the coast, escorted by, by three similar choppers as decoys. The avocado, blood orange, and grapefruit trees would die from drought would die from drought and neglect years later. But the olives and Phoenix Canarius palm trees Sheila purchased at the depths of the Great Recession would grow taller than a three-story house. Although the Obamas would never return, the vines planted by Barack and Michelle would grow to cover the gazebo, then smother it. Today, the gazebo is tattered in ruins. The vines are strong with hope.